My name is Venkatesh Bagaria. I'm a senior product manager with the Amazon recognition team. And today I'm going to be presenting with uh, Jolene and James from Widmob, who are one of our customers. And a big hello to the Twitch audience who's uh, watching us live on stream today. A couple of logistics. Uh, we are going to be taking uh, Twitch questions over the chat. And for your questions, I request you to uh, hold on till the end of the session. We'll stick around, and we can take it in this area. So uh, in this session, we are going to be talking about Amazon recognition, uh, what it is, what are its features, what are some of the use cases that we are seeing uh, you know, people uh, do. And we're going to talk about some interesting customer stories. And all throughout this, we'll be showing some demos and some architectures, as well as sharing some best practices to understand uh, how people are using this and uh, how to be effective while using Amazon recognition. So let's get started. So Amazon recognition uh, is a deep learning-based image and video analysis uh, service. And uh, with this, you can easily add integrated visual analysis to all your uh, you know, image or video assets. Uh, with Amazon recognition image, you can search, verify, and organize millions of images uh, in a single day. And with video, what you also get is time and motion context along with uh, what you get for image. And you could even process uh, stored video or live videos. Um, and we can support gigabytes of you know, uh, content with this. So there's a lot of uh, interesting things that people are doing with this. But before we go into that, uh, let's look at what the capabilities are today for Amazon recognition. So starting with image, uh, we have these six capabilities. And uh, we have been iterating at a fast clip to add new ones. So we started out uh, in uh, November 2016, I remember. It was reInvent. And uh, we launched with the first three capabilities that you see there. So object and scene detection uh, essentially is uh, where you pass in an image, and it tells you what objects or scenes or concepts that you see in that. Facial analysis, as the name suggests, uh, helps you detect faces and also analyze it for attributes such as uh, age, gender, demographics, uh, and things of that nature. For facial recognition, uh, you can actually create a database where you could put in uh, faces of people, and then you can search against that. And there are some very interesting use cases that I'll go over uh, later in during this talk. Then uh, these, these were the three that we launched with. And then uh, in 2017, we added unsafe uh, image detection. Essentially, if your image has any sort of nudity or suggestive content, um, it's always good to make sure your users don't get exposed to that. So this helps you do that uh, pretty automatically. Then we launched celebrity uh, recognition, where uh, we have trained a model with hundreds and thousands of popular figures in sports, politics, media, uh, you name it. Uh, and what you get is if you give an image, it will find the people in it, and then it will recognize if it's a celebrity. And finally, uh, in November last year, we launched uh, text and image, which is essentially our uh, text detection and recognition service, uh, which works on real-world text. It's not really built for documents. And uh, we'll go into some of the use cases there. So um, also last year in November, we launched uh, Amazon Recognition Video. Now, as you can see here, most of the capabilities we have in image are transferred over. You have object and scene detection. You have facial analysis, facial recognition. But there are some key differences uh, as well. So the first thing is, of course, with video, you get time and motion context. You get a timeline of what is uh, happening in the video, even if you were doing something like label detection. And that's very useful for a lot of applications. Um, the other three things that I would like to point out, the first one is activity detection, as you see there. Um, so this is things like uh, you know, if it's a child is falling, or somebody's blowing into candles, or uh, you know, somebody's drinking. These are all activities which require you to understand what's really happening across different frames. It's not just about uh, a certain f one frame. You have to understand the context across different frames. The second one is uh, pathing. Um, so this is essentially, it allows you to figure out the trajectories of uh, where people are going. 
And uh, a lot of interesting use cases, like recently the Soccer World Cup concluded, and a lot of this technology is used, uh, or, or variants of these are used for those kind of applications, where you can figure out where players are going throughout the duration of a video. And then finally, we have uh, support for real-time uh, live stream. And this is enabled through Kinesis video streams. So uh, we have documentation and uh, best practices on how to hook up Amazon recognition in just live stream video through Kinesis video streams and then apply analysis on it. So what I'll do now is I'll quickly jump into a short demo of the recognition console. And this is a great way to get started. So let's see if things work out here. <laughs> All right, yeah, it's up on screen. So as you can see here, uh, I was talking about object and scene detection. And what this does is you could just upload any of your own images. And you can get the results back. And the good thing about this is it shows you the results, but it also shows you the API response here. And so you could really understand how these APIs work. And this is very easy to get started. So if you have an AWS account, I highly encourage you to go there and just play around. And all our different capabilities are available here. Uh, I'll show you some facial analysis as well. So here, as you can see, uh, it found the face. Uh, it found the different uh, attributes here. And again, you can study the response. And once you are done with that, uh, if you want to look at the documentation, you can just click this link, and it will take you to the documentation. So it's pretty easy to get started. Um, and there's also a video analysis console here. Um, what this does is uh, there's this video of uh, Jeff and Werner having a chat. And uh, it's actually aggregating a lot of useful information for you. You can see here it found uh, people. It, it has found celebrities, a lot of objects and activities. For example, uh, it found human, audience, crowd. Let me see if this video actually plays. So once it switches to Jeff, uh, you can actually look at what's happening here. So you can see Werner is only in the second half, and Jeff is in the first half. So again, I encourage you to upload your own videos here, uh, and you could just play around and see how it works. OK, so now that we have seen uh, how the basics work, um, we have seen a lot of good traction from customers in every imaginable vertical since we launched. And if you see some of the names there, you will see a lot of themes emerging. Uh, on the left-hand side, you will see influencer marketing or advertising kind of companies who have been using a lot of the label detection uh, or object and scene detection products. And these help them find out what is happening in images. And based on that, they can do uh, targeting as well as match different things uh, very well together. You can see some names here, uh, like Pinterest or uh, SmugMug, which is in the photo sharing or social media space. So as you can imagine, these customers have large volumes of images, uh, and they need to understand what's happening on their platforms. So uh, recognition is very useful for that kind of stuff. Uh, then you will see a lot of media companies mentioned here, like Sky News, C-SPAN, uh, Make.TV, Scripps. Um, we are seeing a lot of use cases where people want to figure out what are the right assets. Uh, so imagine if you are a media company and you, you're looking for, let's say, videos with Michael Jackson in them. You could use the Celebrity API and quickly get that. So they have large archives of content which really needs uh, quick uh, search capabilities. And there are many other use cases that we are seeing there. And then uh, on the right-hand side, you see uh, names like uh, Thorn and Marinus, who are actually using uh, recognition for uh, anti-trafficking efforts. It's a very noble cause, and we are happy to play a small part in that. Um, and then finally, you see uh, other names like um, 
camp side and send cooperation uh, at the right and bottom side. Very interesting use cases here. Uh, these, uh, these companies actually serve summer camps and other events where uh, kids participate. And parents often want to find out pictures of their kids. And so uh, using recognition, they're able to look through their archive and retrieve uh, pictures of a particular child and give it to the parents. So it's, it's pretty interesting. So what I'm going to do now is uh, walk through each of the capabilities in more detail. And as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, the idea will be to talk about mostly some tips and tricks, but also the kind of use cases we are seeing and uh, the customer stories that have uh, come to light uh, in terms of some very interesting ways to use these technologies. So object and scene detection, uh, as I've mentioned, is essentially you give it an image, and it tells you what's in it. So for example, if I were to take a picture of this audience right now, it'll probably tell me that this is a conference room. There are people here. Some of you have laptops, so it's probably going to catch that. There's chairs. So with that kind of information available, uh, you can do a lot. And the two themes that we are seeing with uh, object and scene detection is search and context. So for search, essentially, once you have your images tagged with this metadata, it's very easy to say, go and find me pictures with people in it, or go and find me pictures where dogs are present. So it could be anything, and you could customize it to your own uh, use cases. But the idea is now you have this information at your fingertips. And for context, uh, it's a slightly different flavor of the same thing. You get the metadata but you actually want to build other models on top of it or maybe combine different services. Let's say you have text, audio, as well as the visual aspect of it. And you combine all of it and say, look, I'm going to create a rich profile or you know, understand user behavior through all these modes. So that's where people are using it to glean context from what is happening. So I want to use this opportunity to kind of uh, bring up an important point about how the image and video APIs differ. So as you, sh as you saw on the console, uh, the image APIs have a fairly simple structure. You can give in the image as an uh, S3 link or directly as bytes if you don't want to store it in S3. And all you get is a simple call to detect labels, and you get a JSON output with name and confidence for each label. It's a simple flat list, and you get all the labels that we have found. So it's pretty uh, straightforward to use, and the information is there. Now with video, um, things are a bit more interesting, because now you need a motion, a time context as well. And there's a timeline aspect to things. On the other hand, videos could be very large, and sometimes the processing time is commensurately large as well. And so for this, we have an asynchronous workflow. And so to set that up, you need to have a way to come back and check that the results are available. And you do this through uh, setting up uh, jobs. And the way to track it, through, uh, track, it, track it is through SNS topics. So in the request, you can see that you can pass in an SNS topic, and once you run the start and get, that's the paradigm here. It's asynchronous, so we start label detection. It gets done, and then you can come and get the results. Uh, what you get back from start is a job ID, which then is the reference point of uh, when the thing is ready, you can go and get the results back. So if you see the results here, uh, it is similar to what we had for image, but there's also other information like uh, what, uh, what are the video characteristics as well as the timeline of when each video showed up. So using this, you can easily create a timeline of what's happening across the video for different labels. So uh, now I'm going to talk about a very interesting area where label detection or object and scene detection has found a lot of success. And this is influencer marketing. So influencer marketing is essentially um, it's a two-sided market where, on one hand, there are brands. And on the other, there are social media influencers who are not really celebrities, but they have a large following on social media. And what uh, brands have found is if they get the right kind of influencers, let's say somebody's uh, really into running, a shoe manufacturer, athletic shoe manufacturer might want to use them as a, uh, as a person to run the campaign. 
So influencer marketing firms uh, specialize in matching these two sides. Uh, and so essentially what they were doing here, um, okay, my clicker is not working. Yeah, there you go. So what they were doing here is using text hashtags uh, on the submitted social media images. So somebody's on Instagram, they post a hashtag uh, with the image that they put there, and they would just scan that. And this is, this is the hashtag-based results for running. So they were looking to run a campaign for an athletic uh, shoe manufacturer, and they were just figuring out what are the images associated with running. And as you can see there, there's a lot of different stuff. It's not all about running. There's food, and there's just shoes. And people put all sorts of hashtags just to have fun, right? So it's not very relevant. And so uh, what they did then was tried the same thing using Amazon recognition, and this is what they were getting. Now, as you can see here, because it's using the visual information available in these images, you are able to figure out much more accurately which images are really about running. Now, when they used this to match influencers with brands, they saw a lot of good impact. So they were seeing 2.6x uh, uh, more insights, and they were able to process more posts as well, because not every image had hashtags, but recognition could process them all and generate the relevant metadata to be able to do uh, work. The other piece that I was talking about, the context um, from user-generated content, and what we have seen here is, again, uh, social media websites, or you know, if you think of a dating app, for example, you want to understand more about the people who are posting images so that you can serve them better. It could be making a better match, suggesting a better match, or being able to personalize the experience based on the preferences of the user. So how would you do that? What we have seen happening is, uh, essentially, if somebody posts a picture like this, Using recognition, you will find that there's a person and a dog in it. And let's say a lot of their pictures have this theme going. It's probably reasonable to say that this person is a dog lover or is a dog owner. And that's very useful information uh, if you are, let's say, matchmaking, for example. Um, same thing with this one. Um, if you run this, you would get person in snowboarding. So again, uh, you know that this person is into winter sports and uh, you know skiing or other kinds of things. So that could be very useful information. Now, the same thing uh, applied to videos actually takes on uh, bigger meaning. So as I was saying, uh, in object and activity detection, um, along with finding just the objects and scenes, this is now also able to figure out that there's an activity across multiple frames. So if you think about something like drinking, um, if I have a single frame, a keyframe or an image of me holding a glass, that does not mean that I'm drinking. What you need is multiple frames to figure out that there's this action happening, and that's very useful. So that's what we provide through the video API. And uh, what we have seen is a lot of interesting use cases for uh, creative content creation, which is essentially how do you create uh, videos which are engaging. And uh, you know, this is a very interesting topic, and I'll just let the experts talk about it a bit more. So please welcome on stage uh, Jolene and James from Widmap. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Um, my name is Jolene McGoldrick, and I'm joined by my colleague James, who is the CTO of Vidmob. And if I can get this clicker, there we go. It's working properly. Pres uh, our presentation is titled, uh, When Every Second Counts, Every Frame Matters. And what we want to talk about today is how we use Amazon recognition to help advertisers, agencies, and publishers develop better and more effective video content. So I realized the irony of showing this image at uh, 5 o'clock in the morning um, and the chaos that this adds, right, this traffic circle. But I think the traffic circle is a really good analogy to what's going on in social media advertising, right? There is a sense of chaos and stasis at the same time. Chaos because the world has moved from one TV asset to hundreds if not thousands of social media assets. And the rules of the game are always changing. New formats are being introduced. 
platforms that maybe the makers aren't even on are being introduced. And the result is a lack of confidence about entering that roundabout and essentially paralysis. What should I do? Why should I do it? I don't want to make a mistake. And that's what we saw when we talk to our clients. And that's really the reason for being for VidMob. Our goal is we, uh, we want to help uh, customers build better video advertising. So we're a network of creators, and we leverage technology um, to produce, analyze, and then optimize video advertising. And what we see is that when we go out and we talk to our customers in the marketplace, that they are fundam fundamentally frustrated and challenged. And what you see on the slide are some verbatims of what they've said to us. It can be very basic things like, I might know what works, but I really don't know why it works. Or how do I strike this balance between not being too text heavy, but also having some context? Um, how do I know when it's time to make new creative? Is the logo, should it be in the first two seconds? Should it not be in the first two seconds? And then my personal favorite, um, do people, puppies or babies, do they always work? Um, I probably won't get to that one today. Um, and then finally, uh, if how do I match make the creative theme or what's in an ad to an audience, right? And these are the concerns uh, that marketers have. So in the past, uh, marketers could pay up for these insights. They could spend $25,000, $30,000 to copy test that one TV ad that they were basing their entire marketing budget on, right, for that year. Um, and then that got more difficult as we moved into digital, because rather than one or two TV ads, we all of a sudden had multiple static digital ads. But there was still a workaround for this. And so I've worked in this. And for years ago, what we would used to do is we'd have a person sitting there, usually an intern or somebody's niece or nephew, sitting in front of a computer, coding up every aspect of the ad, right? Is there a puppy, a baby, or a person? Yes, no. How many words are in the ad? Let me count. What's the color? Where's the logo? And they would count up all these things. And the first week always started out great. They were happy to have a job. By week two, week three, week four, the time degraded, the quality degraded. And then as more and more assets got introduced into the ecosystem, right, the, the tens to hundreds to thousands, um, it just became impossible to keep up with. And so largely, the industry sort of threw their hands up in the air, and they said, we don't know what works, and we don't know why it works, right? So you can imagine if you are a brand manager in the Midwest and you have to make a Snapchat ad, that hearing we don't know what works and why it works is not necessarily a very comforting experience, right? It doesn't encourage you to create more. And that was the challenge we saw in the marketplace. And I think what we've developed uh, in partnership with Amazon Recognition is leveraging this technology for video uh, to be able to solve that challenge for our clients. Uh, it's tremendously streamlined and was, has been very quick for us to build. So for some context, December 1st, we were debating this challenge. What do we do? Do we get an army of moms or college students to help us understand every frame of a video? Uh, by December 4th, Amazon recognition for video had come online. Um, and the stuff that I'll show you today has all been built since then, which we, we find to be somewhat remarkable. And so specifically what we've built is called the Agile Creative Studio. And what it does is it leverages the machine learning and computer vision that Amazon provides us. And it marries creative talent and data and analytics. And rather than data and analytics being a report card for creative talent, what it, which is what it's usually been when it's not available till four, five, or six months later, it can be a tool for them to develop better creative. Because we're a video company, I think it's best that I show you a video to explain the functionality here. So stick with me.
Thanks, Jolene. So our secret is that we built the technology before marketing created the video. So anybody who's familiar with engineering, typically it is the reverse. And with our partnership with Amazon, we're able to really create um, the products that are powering what Jolene was mentioning. So my name is James Kubernick. I'm the CTO here at VidMob. And I'm going to talk to, talk to you a little bit about um, how we are leveraging Amazon um, to really create the science behind the creative process. So as Jolene mentioned, um, the creative attributes are something that is becoming very, very important to both our creators and marketers who are using our platform. And so with Amazon Recognition Service, other models that we are creating, we're able to deconstruct videos to identify people, key visuals, we're layering in the production characteristics that are coming from our production platform, and we have this human in the loop element to help identify other attributes that are associated with the creative. So with our partnership, you know, at what we do is, is we believe in the power of human creativity. And so our platform and our technology is built around this idea that if we employ people and humans to create content, that is the best way to create great content. But as we move from this world of single format TV content into a world of multiple format video content for social and mobile, we believe that technology is gonna play a pivotal role in helping our creators continue to create that great content at scale. So with Amazon, you know, we're able to focus on several areas to help drive that process. You know, the first thing is, is that our customers come from a wide array of verticals. So from home, home and garden, health and beauty, entertainment, gaming, we are servicing a very diverse set of creative and we are processing all that creative very confidently and quickly through Amazon services so that we can take that data and apply it um, as shown in the video. Because of, because of those services, you know, we're focused then on really building the solutions and products that help enable our clients to answer the questions that, that they were asking. Because we're not just an analytics platform, we are a full production um, platform, we utilize Amazon's full suite of services from storage to data transfer to notification and queuing systems to build a fully integrated media pipeline from the moment media hits our platform to storing it, to making it available to our creative community, to then processing it through recognition and then moving that data into our data pipeline so that we can um, represent it through our features. We went one step too far. So because we're talking about recognition here, I'm gonna focus just a little bit on the recognition part of our media pipeline. So as Ken was early, covered a little bit earlier, the video recognition service has several endpoints where you can extract um, data from a video that you're processing. You can look at labels, you can look for celebrities, faces, and people. And so for us, we want to gather as much data as possible. And to organize the calls um, to each of those services, we rely on Lambda functions and step functions to control that process. So as we start to process media through our recognition with a C service. Um, so we use recognition as our definition because we're using recognition with a K. We're also using the transcription service with Amazon and also using our own models to process this media. But we use the step function to help control that process. And so we kick off, uh, a, lambda, a lambda function kicks off our step function process, which then triggers uh, a variety of different lambda functions to kick off recognition quick off transcription, and then monitors those processes for when they return, or whether they fail, and then we have to restart them. And then once all those processes complete, we, we then trigger our final Lambda functions to then move that data into our data pipeline so we can make use of it. So when we look at that step function as part of our um, recognition process, Every piece of media that comes into our platform, um, as was mentioned, we, we use SQS and SNS to, to queue up that media for processing, SNS topics to monitor the process of those, and then we kick off the, the step function with each piece of media. And with Amazon services, 
in combination with recognition, we've been able to build a serverless and instantly scalable media pipeline for processing the thousands of, of media assets that are uploaded to our platform on a daily basis. So as that data, go back one more slide. We'll see. There it is. So as we funnel that data into our data pipeline, as Jolene mentioned and was in our uh, video, we have API integrations with all the major social platforms. And then we are intersecting that creative attribute data with performance data so that we can paint a picture for both our creators and our clients about what are the elements in their creative that is helping to drive performance. And we're looking at KPIs between view through and the KPIs that drive engagement for their brand or their product um, and their marketing campaign. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Jolene to just wrap up and show how we're using this data in some of our reporting. Thank you, just the clicker. Fantastic, so what does the technology that we've built together with Amazon look like? I'm gonna show you that. So as James mentioned, we're integrated with all of the major social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Pinterest, Twitter, and we're able to understand frame by frame in a video, what exactly is it that, is that's happening? So if you look at this image right here, you'll see on the top, you'll see the retention curve. Usually you would just see that a certain percentage of people dropped out, but you would not know why. So what we're able to surface is frame by frame when people are dropping out and what it is that's happening, not just at that moment, but before that moment that might be causing people to stay or leave. Because despite uh, the critics who say that it has nothing to do with creative and it's all about media, we see huge variance between the best performing and the worst performing creative. Um, and it's largely driven by what is in the ad itself. And so if you look here, we're able to surface um, via Amazon recognition, everything about the text of the ad, how, dex how dense is the text, how many words are on the screen at any one moment, how fast is it being spoken, how fast is it being shown on the screen. We're able to see things like people, all of the sentiments that they have at any particular frame of there. Do I go from happy to sad within a frame? We can surface the celebrities, which we know are a huge part of our advertiser or client's marketing budget, uh, the landscape, the background, and then all of the objects in there frame by frame. And for our clients who aren't even used to understanding how any one creative performs, this is absolutely eye-opening. So this is one creative, but the real power of it, right, we're not at a one creative world anymore. We're at a multiple creative world, hundreds and thousands of creatives. So this same potential, when we scale it, across to hundreds and thousands of creatives, we're able to identify the trends within our media and how those trends vary by format and by audience so that we can begin to answer those questions like, does a puppy make someone stay longer? Is that true for every demographic? How does that play out in different formats and different placements, which enable our clients, our advertisers, agencies, and publishers to begin to make better, more effective, and more economical decisions? They can edit frame by frame so that they can cut out the extraneous things or the things that have been driving lower performance and put back into market rather than in a matter of weeks or months, in a matter of days, they can re-enter better, more uh, high-performing creative. So ultimately, for this audience, what's most important really is understanding the business impact. Was this worthwhile for us to do? And if so, what was the scope of that? Um, so we calculate that since using Amazon recognition, we've saved, and these numbers are so remarkable to me sometimes that I have to take a pause to show them, but we've run the numbers, <laughs> we've all agreed, and it's quite phenomenal. We've saved about 22,500 man hours on this when we think about how long it takes to code up each frame of a video. We've reduced production time of any one video asset by 21 days because we're able to produce smarter, more data-informed creative. And we've increased um, ROI on our clients' primary and secondary KPIs by 80%. So for our business, this has been absolutely transformational. With that, I would like to thank you all for your time and attention. I'd be remiss if I didn't say have a good drive home, and we'd be thrilled to talk to you more about how we've worked together with the Amazon team. Thank you.
Thanks, Jolene and James. That was really interesting. So now, uh, coming back to uh, recognition capabilities, what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk is uh, go through the rest of them and kind of show the use cases and, again, uh, some tips and tricks for them. So starting with the image and video moderation, now, as I was mentioning, uh, if you run anything with social media or user-generated content where you allow users to upload stuff, there's always the risk of somebody uploading uh, pictures containing nudity, suggestive content, and all sorts of other things. And so uh, what we have done with our image and video moderation API is given an image, it puts out these hierarchical labels. Uh, there's a top-level category for explicit content and suggestive content. And then you also get a bit more detail. The reason for this is uh, our customers told us that they have different business rules depending on different use cases. So for example, if you are uh, doing an app for children, you don't want even mildly suggestive content to show through. Or if you run something in the Middle East or a very conservative uh, kind of marketplace, you don't want that content to show through. In other places, it might be fine. It's not very clear uh, what those rules will be. And sometimes they change over time as well. So our idea was to give as much information back to users as possible and let them make the rules. And that's why we have this hierarchical set of labels uh, which tell you more about why this image is unsafe. And then you are free to kind of figure out what's the best combination uh, of rules that will give you the best experience. And uh, what happens with this is this is just like labels. It puts out a set of these labels. Each of them have confidence scores associated with them. What we've seen customers do is um, this was typically done through uh, extensive manual review. So there are platforms where content safety is of paramount importance, and not a single image which is unsafe should go through. And so for those uh, platforms, what people used to do is have large manual workforces which would go through every image. This is extremely tedious and expensive. And even then, you know, humans get tired. As your platforms get to scale, this approach just does not keep up. And so with recognition, what they're able to do now is reduce the amount of stuff that humans have to see drastically. So what could happen here is you pass every image through recognition, and it will, uh, it will flag the ones which are supposed to have nudity, and then those could be reviewed by humans. We've also seen customers build more complex rules where uh, for example, if it's a very high confidence that it contains um, unsafe content, they just reject it. If there's a band of, let's say, 70 to 90%, they'll send it to the human. Below that, they'll say it's safe. So people come up with all these rules. And the workflow that you see here is essentially that. You pass every image. Um, it can be something as simple as it goes into S3. A Lambda function is triggered every time that happens. And you automatically call recognition to um, inspect this image. If it passes, that's fine. If it's flagged, you send it to a human, and then uh, the thing can be moderated. So uh, there are myriad use cases for this. I mean, if you have a photo sharing website, if you have a dating website, anything where people are uploading pictures, this is useful. Okay. All right. Um, so um, Swole Platform is uh, it's a, it's a platform for dating websites. They actually provide services there. So they have been using us in production to make sure that uh, such an images don't go through. And uh, again, the idea is they have pretty much this workflow that you see here uh, going through um, first uh, automatic review, and then it goes through machine uh, human review. So now let's talk about uh, facial detection and analysis. And this has a very interesting set of features, which again can be uh, tweaked to create business rules of your own liking. So what we do here is we detect up to 100 faces in an image, and we also give you uh, attributes as well as the bounding box for this. So as you can see here, uh, you know, once you get the bounding box, you are able to find the location of faces. You could count different faces. You can make sure that if you're placing an ad on the image, it's not placed on somebody's face. There's a lot of stuff you could do. But outside of that, we also give you a lot of other information here uh, the primary one being demographics. So we have age, gender, and then we have emotions. Now, these are very interesting uh, because you could 
look at uh, you know the kind of pictures somebody is uploading all throughout your platform and get a sense of what are your key demographics, who are the people using your platform. Um, you could also, in interactive use cases, let's say uh, you run a retail store or some sort of events, and you have kiosks where people can go and do certain actions. Let's say they can buy tickets or in interact with your things. You could use this to understand uh, if they're frustrated or they're angry, if they're happy. And also, based on the demographics, you could tailor the content based on that. We also have uh, other things like landmarks and pose. So with landmarks, you get uh, 25 points, which are basically it will tell you where the eyes are, where the nose is. And uh, this could be useful for applications such as if you are running, a, let's say, a fashion website, and you want to figure out where the lips are on somebody's face, and maybe you want to do some more post-processing after that, shade it with a different lipstick color, and kind of show virtual try-on type use cases. It's very useful for that. Um, pose is uh, also a very interesting one. Um, so let's say you want to understand or review an image and make sure that people are facing front and not really, you know, this is roll, there's pitch, there's yaw. So it, it gives you all those numbers, and based on that, you can create rules which, um, which will allow you to make sure that only the images which are good, somebody is looking in front. You could also look for whether they're smiling or not, so there's those attributes as well. So really, quite a bit of different things. We have facial hair as well. And then uh, one more interesting one is eyes open. So we will tell you if the person's eyes are open or not. And um, some interesting use cases we have heard in that is for driver safety or you know worker safety. If somebody's operating heavy machinery and they have a long shift, you don't want them to fall asleep at the wheel. That's pretty dangerous. So with a system like this, you could simply figure out if their eyes are closed and you could warn the supervisor or you know have some sort of uh, alarm go off so that they wake up. There's a lot of interesting things uh, that could be done with the combination of these uh, parameters that we put out. And here's just a flavor I think you saw a little bit in the console, so I'll uh, not spend too much time on this. Uh, this is how the API responses look. It's uh, pretty simple. You give the image for every face found. We'll give you the bounding box. We'll give you the attributes. So you can see here uh, there's emotions, there's whether the person is wearing eyeglasses, their eyes are open or not, and so on. So how would you use this to create the rules that I was just talking about? So again, coming back to the social or dating website kind of thing, let's say you want to ensure that the pictures uploaded follow certain guidelines. And the guidelines could be, this needs to be a face, there needs to be only one person here, and you know uh, their eyes are open, they're smiling, and things like that. So if somebody uploads this picture, recognition would not find a face, and you could easily reject that picture saying, there's no face in that. Um, if somebody uploads this, you could find that their eyes are closed, and you could notify them that, look, this picture is probably not the best. Um, you, know, you could create a lot of fun features. And then the, finally, this one is a group picture, and it will tell you there are 10 faces. Uh, maybe you want to create a rule on that. Maybe you don't, but that information is available. So moving on to a face search, um, the idea here is that you're able to now create a collection or a database of faces where you could, you could uh, put in some uh, data about different people. And then later, when any image is shown or a video is shown, uh, you can find the same person in that. So you can identify people. OK, that's went too far. Um, so as I was saying earlier, we have seen a very interesting use case in anti-trafficking. and. Madness Analytics is a startup based out of CMU um, who are looking to use AI to fight uh, human trafficking. So what happens here is a lot of uh, children are sometimes captured and they are put into the trade. And the way that works is um, the traffickers put out a lot of ads. And these ads are online and they're like uh, print ads and you know, there's a lot of images with them. So if somebody has been reported missing, uh, their image is on file. Uh, in this case, you know somebody's Facebook picture was available, and what Mariners does through a, a tool called Traffic Jam, and they have a face search part in there, they're able to now, using recognition, 
very quickly scan through a lot of images, and if they're able to match if any missing person shows up in those ads. And using this, uh, within the first week of rolling this out, they were able to detect that uh, you know, one of their cases actually showed up, and they were able to save that person. And ever since, a lot of other people have been saved. Um, we're also seeing uh, another organization called Thorn uh, using the same thing with facial recognition. So it's really humbling uh, to see such impact on society through you know, something that we built, and we are super excited to support them going forward. Um, this is a bit more fun uh, compared to the last one. So what happened in May was there was this royal wedding. I don't know if a lot of you were interested in that, but there was a lot of media spotlight. And the guest list included the who's who of you know, celebrities all over. And what used to happen before was in these events, they would have um, people who were stationed to spot when a celebrity is coming in. So if David Beckham is coming in or if Sir Elton John is coming in, somebody would, you know, actually go and see that and then report back and then they would show it in the feed. So what Sky News wanted to do was um, use AI to make this process much more automated as well as uh, you know, have this immediate uh, live stream going on. So the, along with our partner, Gray Meta, they built this interesting page for the royal wedding where they had beforehand created a face collection with the list of celebrities who were supposed to attend. and. Um, Using that, they were able to very easily, as soon as the people came in uh, with the camera, they were able to recognize that this person has walked in. And in the live feed, it, it was shown that, hey, uh, right now, you know, the celebrity has come in. And people who follow celebrities, and there are a lot of people who are interested in this, um, they were able to follow along in the live stream and immediately find the places where you know, their favorite celebrity was showing up. So we've also seen uh, some very um, interesting use cases in the authentication space where you know, um, if you have uh, face-based authentication as a second factor, uh, it's very useful for um, workloads where you know, um, often it was difficult earlier to, or it was easy to, for people to spoof the system because you know you, you couldn't see who it was. So uh, a classic example of this is uh, facility access control. So you know this could be office buildings, this could be uh, you know concerts, or even you know entry to something like the summit here. How do you figure out it's the right person coming in? Um, if you have a record of this person's picture, or if they've taken a selfie while registering, it's very easy to do this. Uh, through recognition. You just build a collection, and then you can search against that. Um, we're also seeing know your customer kind of use cases where when you are opening a bank account or if you are kind of uh, signing up for some financial services, you are able to submit a picture. And uh, later, you could just take a selfie when you're doing a transaction, and they will know that it's you. It, it can match the picture on file. Uh, and finally, if you, know, if you have password reset kind of use cases at an ATM or if your account is getting locked, Instead of having the person come all the way over to the branch, uh, you know you could do uh, a remote password reset because if they take a selfie, you're uh, you're reasonably assured that it's it's not a completely different person. And uh, we've seen some uh, some really um, interesting places that these have been used. Uh, in fact, in the developing world, uh, Paylater and Isla are both from Africa. So in, in, in the African market, it's a very underserved market, and banking has not penetrated as much as it can. Um, it's very difficult to access some of these areas. And the incidence of fraud on these financial platforms was getting difficult to manage. So now, using the techniques that I just talked about uh, by just making sure that while signing up, they have their uh, faces stored, they were able to uh, increase the um, um, security of their platforms uh, significantly. Oops. All right, so uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with K-pop, uh, but this is an extremely popular form of music in Korea. And uh, one of our customers, uh, the K-Star Group, uh, they are a ticketing company. And the problem they had was in these concerts, which are super popular, there used to be long lines at the venue. When you are entering the concert, you bring in your printout of your paper ticket, and everybody needs to go through that process. Somebody checks the ticket, and then, uh, you know, 
it, the, the check-in process is extremely long, and so the lines used to be very long. So what they did was they built a system using uh, what they, they call as face ticket, and what they do here is um, they ask the uh, concert goer to you know, submit a selfie at the time of registration, and then when, they, when the event comes, they have this kiosk where uh, you know, our facial recognition software is running, and as soon as somebody walks in, it takes a picture, and it's able to match it to the all the pictures that are there and find the match. So the check-in process now becomes much more streamlined. And in fact, uh, you know, yesterday and today in Korea, there's an annual Korean music festival, KMF, with a lot of audience. And uh, you know, KSTAR is doing the ticketing for that. And our system is currently running there and kind of helping them streamline and manage the entry process. So uh, we have looked at all these interesting use cases of how to use facial recognition. So how would you go about actually building this uh, if you wanted to? So um, the idea here is it's a three-step process. You have a collection, which is the database where you store the faces. All the faces that you want to put into that, so let's say you have you know 1,000 people that you, that's the set of people you're looking for. You get images for these people, and then you index it into the collection. So th these are all simple APIs. Um, you just take the image, we'll find the face, and we'll index it into the collection. So what we do is we store facial vectors. So it's a very concise representation, uh, which is non-identifiable. And then once you have this, uh, there's a third API where, let's say, coming back to the case star use case, um, you're taking the live picture. Uh, that one is you can pass it through search faces by image. And it will match it against the collection, and it will give you the ID of the person, and it will give you a similarity score. So based on this, you could say, hey, if there's a 90% you know, or 95% match, uh, this is the same person. Otherwise, you know, if it's 80 to 90%, I want to flag this for a human operator. Below that, I want to reject it, and things like that. So let's look at uh, how this would actually work. So let's say you had a lot of images uh, stored, and you wanted to index them. Uh, you could, again, go back to the same pattern of using S3 and Lambda to automatically do this as soon as the images come in. Uh, you could use recognition to index that into a collection. And there's also, uh, for every face you index, there's a face ID associated with it. Uh, you could put this information along with the other things like the person's name or other attributes that you have collected through your own platforms into Dynamo as a metadata table. And now, uh, once you have your app, you could, for example, use Cognito for security. And then once the picture is taken from the app, you could go back to the collection. And just using search faces, as I showed you, uh, you could find who the person is. And then join that back to the DynamoDB data to give back the results, saying, I found person X. Here's all the information about the person that you know, I have on file. So uh, very quickly, some uh, best practices when you are using faces. Um, typically, for face recognition, you want a certain amount of quality uh, in the face. So if the face is very, very small, there's not enough information there. So we recommend at least 24 to 32 pixels or 5% of the image size as the smallest size of the face. It's also good to filter out bad quality faces when you are indexing, because if you throw in garbage in there, you know that's not good for accuracy. So based on some of the parameters that we have, you could filter out um, some things like if it's too small, you could look at the bounding box size. Pose, you could, as I said, you have the pose parameters. You could put some rules on that and say, this is too extreme a pose. The person is not looking uh, straight up. So let's just reject this image. And a bunch of other stuff. So it depends on your use case. You could create your own rules. And then uh, for interactive use cases, you know, where let's say I'm taking a picture on a phone and I want to give back the results quickly, it doesn't make sense to go to S3 and store the image. You could do that as a background process. But the best idea might be to just send bytes directly and get the results back, because it's interactive. So that, that will help you reduce uh, time. And you could also reduce the image resolution. I mean, typically, you don't need a 1080p image of a close-up of a face. That's a lot of information. You could get away with probably 720p or VGA. And if it's a smaller thing, you could uh, figure out what the relative ratio should be. 
And finally, we always uh, recommend kind of using uh, multiple images, lighting conditions, viewpoints, because uh, although our algorithms are very resilient to these changes, there are obviously limits to how resilient they will be to extreme changes. So if you have those kind of uh, changes uh, in the appearance and uh, lighting and all that, it's best to kind of have multiple images per identity. So uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, text and image. And this is essentially our um, solution for real world images. I was saying this is not really built for documents. This is for sparse text. What we have done here is we have taken care of, uh, taken care that it works for various fonts, layouts, even if it's stylized, even if it's oriented at different uh, orientations. All of that is taken care of. And you will see a lot of it this showing up in the kind of creative content that Jolene was talking about, or even social media content, memes, uh, you know, people trying to scam by posting phone numbers or email addresses where they should not. So all of these things uh, show up. And so, so the use cases that we see here um, are very interesting. Um, one of them is reading road signs. So here is a mapping company who uh, you know go around uh, different places and they figure out what's the information that they can put into their maps, and they build rich maps using this. So using recognition uh, here has been able to read a variety of street signs, and as you can see, there's some challenges here. In the second image, you'll see the font is kind of oriented as well as um, it has uh, stylized uh, elements to it. The third one is kind of low resolution, nighttime image. But we've taken care of all of that in our training. It's resilient to a lot of variations. So it's meant for real world use cases where you know, the things are not very controlled. And then uh, another use case that we have seen is from uh, Sportograph. Um, so this one is where when people are running in marathons, after it's finished, they're always looking for pictures of themselves running, or their family members are looking for that. And it's very difficult for uh, companies like Sportograph to find these images when you have a large repository of you know, thousands of pictures. So what they do have is the information where the bib number and the person's name is already available to them because they all registered for the race. So what they're doing is they're using text and image to run through all these images, read the bib numbers, and with that, immediately they're able to locate the right pictures which have the right people. So this has helped them really improve their business by being able to quickly find the right images to uh, you know, put up for sale or kind of uh, just give it to people. So uh, finally, uh, kind of putting it all together, um, I just wanted to quickly go through a simple architecture here where you might want to do multiple things uh, together. And the idea here is uh, using step functions. So just as James was saying, oftentimes your workloads will have uh, a need to use, for example, text plus face plus moderation. So how would you do that? Again, the same uh, on the input side, the same parameters can be used or same services can be used. You could use Lambda to trigger as soon as the image is stored in S3. And uh, using step functions, you could create any sort of state machine or workflow which combines the output of these services. So for example, you could run label detection and say, if the image contains a person, I want to process it further. If not, I just want to throw it away. And then you could run, let's say, moderation. You could run a text. You could look for people. Essentially, anything that you want to do. Uh, but the idea here is uh, through step functions, you're able to now create workflows and not just get a single set of uh, API outputs. And once you get this, uh, you know you could uh, just store this metadata. You could send it for human review. Uh, you could put it in Elasticsearch, which is another pattern we see pretty commonly uh, for labels or any kind of metadata. Uh, people create Elasticsearch uh, indexes to be able to then search their images or videos against that metadata. So uh, I'll leave you with these uh, links here. Um, the Amazon machine learning blog particularly has a lot of interesting articles about uh, different things like how to build a facial recognition system, a lot of use cases, uh, code samples to get started. So I highly recommend anybody interested uh, to look at that. And there's like complete examples worked through with all the code provided. The user review system I was talking about at the end, uh, also there's a GitHub repository for that. So that's the last link here. If you want to play around with that kind of a step function system, uh, you can get that done as well. 
And of course, our homepage has a lot of information um, about our customers and different use cases. So that's all I had today. Um, please do submit session feedback, um, what you liked, what you didn't like. It really helps us improve the next time. And that's all I had. So thank you.